It would be really fitting to start this video with a rant, because the internet loves rants. But I'm not going to do that. Let's um, call this a precautionary tale. If you've seen my previous video on the repair of the Sanyo uh, boombox that was a surprise present for a friend, um, you'll know that this um, project goes back to um, early December. And I mentioned in there that um, I'd aimed to get him a cassette player and the boombox was actually plan B. The initial plan was uh, a Walkman and a very specific era of uh, so the Sony Walkman, um, not for any special reason other than it was um, a specific kind of Walkman that a friend kind of alerted me to, got me into, and um, I was interested in repairing. Like a lot of things online, uh, it's really common to find um, these in a broken state, because I'm going to tell you straight away, they're all broken, um, because they break themselves. And uh, it's really common to find them in that state, usually with a description that will say something like, ah, I only need a five pound belt, easy fix. Um, I'm here to tell you that's bullshit. And um, we're gonna do some myth busting in this. The repair of this EX series of Walkman from around about 1988 to about 1992 um, has been covered quite a bit on YouTube. I almost didn't bother doing it myself, except for this one. This was the initial model that I tried to get for my friend and um, I've done a full repair on this one and I have 45 minutes of video of that repair. Not of the complete repair, it didn't quite go to the end, um, which is why it's never been posted online. Um, this was a real ordeal and uh, what started off as um, simple parts turned into problem after problem after problem, which is why, not including this one, I'll come to this one later, um, which is why I ended up with <laughs> all these bits. Um, so this one has been restored and is fully working. This is just as a token gesture, is my original from around about 1993, possibly, my original childhood Walkman. The plastic fantastic ex21 um, this has been with me on school trips and all sorts it's even got my name scratched in the back and um, it's a fantastic little thing the only problem this has ever given me is after about 20 years of life the belt snapped and it was a fairly quick and simple job to replace the belt it's never failed in any other way um, these little ex models on the other hand, <laughs> beautiful, but troublesome. Um, I will give you a very quick rundown of why I have each of these and their expected faults based on what I had to deal with for this one. This is an EX49, which is a UK model. Uh, this came out around about, I think, 1990, and it was one of the first EX models, as they called it, which is more or less cassette sized. It uses this mechanism where the uh, heads uh, open up into the door rather than being fixed into the main body. So you slip the cassette in like that and then close the cassette into the main body so it actually goes kind of upside down compared to most Walkmans before it that went that way. Um, it makes it extremely compact and uh, uses a fairly complicated mechanism to deal with all the auto reverse and what have you at this scale. This EX model has got a bit of a lump on the back where you can put an AA battery. Um, the later models use what they call the gumstick battery which is a flat rechargeable battery like this. You can see this is much flatter and the gumstick battery goes in there. Coincidentally that can take a gumstick battery as well instead of the AA in the same one. But it took, uh, yeah, another revision before they were very, very thin, like this one. So this is the first one I got from eBay UK. And um, I expected that it would have the following faults. A bad belt, that's the obvious one. 
bad capacitors on the board. Coincidentally, this is the same board. Um, not only surface mount capacitors, which are very short surface mount capacitors, they have to be to get the clearance, um, but also these capacitors, which are actually just regular electrolytics, but they're actually held sideways in a little plastic package. This is on a very thin board, has to be very thin again for the clearance. So they have to be uh, removed very carefully with hot air, not too hot, it has to be really carefully controlled. Um, and then actually soldering new capacitors on is fraught with danger because you can see very, very close to where the capacitors are. You've got plastic switches, other passive components, tiny proprietary chips, plastic pieces of sockets, battery clips and what have you. Um, absolutely not an easy fix at all. Uh, a pretty tricky job. Third problem I found on this was um, the switches on the back. Uh, you've got a tape selector and a Dolby switch. Um, and on this board it's, it's actually these really tiny flat switches at the top. And um, I had trouble with the Dolby switch on mine and you'd think, well I don't use Dolby, it doesn't really matter. Well actually uh, it catches you out because if that switch starts to go faulty it's more like the Dolby actually gets stuck on and kind of flutters in and out and just sounds terrible and it took several attempts um, with switch cleaner being left in it overnight before it would cooperate. So these plastic gears, uh, there is under this gear, there is a clutch assembly and unfortunately uh, it's this particular era of um, the plastics that are used which are prone to cracking. There's a clutch gear underneath that's pressure fit uh, into a, a plastic spindle on here, I'll explain more later. And it's renowned for cracking and if it does crack the take up uh, on the drive of the tape is erratic and quite often cuts out. That problem of cracked gears also applies to gears such as this one which are on the back of the reels, the reel gears. If they crack, uh, the reel is plastic, has a little plastic pin through that gear. If it comes loose, the reels just fall out, like that one did. There's a big element already of, yes, they eat themselves. Next problem, which this one had, these motors are renowned for corroding, failing, and this one, unfortunately, was completely unsalvageable. This is the reason I have multiple of these. This is actually the original chassis from this one. And um, I did a full recap of its board and um, I replaced the broken clutch gear with one, uh, an aftermarket one that um, a guy in Slovakia makes and um, mechanically got it working, uh, put a new belt on and then the motor failed. <laughs> so I had to source another for um, a motor, which is where this beautiful 190 comes in. This came from Japan, uh, it came in the same order as that uh, Sanyo boombox and I, it was basically a buy it now and it said condition unknown. So as they put it in Japanese sales vernacular, they called it junk. Um, it was unknown condition, it was a fairly reasonable price, so I threw it on the back of the order and it turned up and apart from one scratch along the top, which looks like somebody's done it with a knife when they've been opening a package and it wasn't me, frustratingly, um, it's beautiful. It's got some slight marking on the Walkman uh, logo on the front, but um, the condition of it is lovely and it came with quite a cool blank tape inside it with glow-in-the-dark reels. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be the subject of the repair. I'm going to uh, use the 
remaining spare clutch that I have because I ordered two uh, clutch gear. Um, I'm going to rebuild the board because they actually share the same board. And this one was another one, or the remains of this was uh, another one that I got for um, the motor for this one. And I ended up just swapping parts around and making the best of the parts that I got and using more or less the entire chassis uh, for um, repair of the EX49. This one might end up getting sold. I don't, I'm not really into selling things. It was a pain in the ass, but um, to pay for the outlay that I've had to put on these and uh, all the time that went into this one, I might have to recuperate some funds on this one. So as it fully works, it's been fully rebuilt and it's not going on eBay saying, oh, I'm sure it just needs a belt. Um, then I think that's probably fair to, uh, to pass that one on. So I want to concentrate on this one and um, take you on the journey of fixing it. I may also cut into some footage uh, from the EX49 repair if any of it's relevant but I mainly want to focus on this one based on what I've learned from this one. Now I know um, having just put power on it from bench power supply so I don't have the rechargeable battery and I don't have the side AA battery holder that these used um, it doesn't really do anything it just um, it just sort of twitches so I think there'll be a gunked up belt we have to get off the mechanism and then I'll apply a voltage to the board and see if the motor will run properly on its own if it doesn't that could be down to a motor fault or it could be down to uh, bad capacitors around the servo driver chip we need to get in this and have a look so let's do that all right before you open one of these little beauties I highly recommend you get yourself uh, an ice cube tray uh, every screw on this more or less is unique um, so if you can put the tiny screws in something like an ice cube tray and um, put labels along the top with a bit of masking tape and a sharpie you'll know exactly what came from where um, something else I forgot to point out earlier actually the Japanese ones uh, where you can tell the Japanese market ones is the uh, DBB there for the um, dynamic base boost on all the European and UK models I think probably the American models they call it mega base which is yeah it's the most 90s thing ever but it didn't age very well did it it's a bit chav the uh, Japanese ones uh, just dial it back a bit you know just a bit classier uh, I think they're really the best way to brand it uh, okay, so I'm going to eject the tape door and I'm going to take off the door, the two uh, hinges here. There's two screws to get yourself a um, JIS screwdriver, preferably the smallest size. So we've got two same size there for the side of the door. So screwdriver hitting my T. And then at the other side on this model we've got one screw. That's actually got a little collar on it so that is different. So I'm going to put that in the front one already. So door away from the hinges, and there we go, the door's off. I'm going to take that off because I don't want to scratch it while I'm throwing it around. Now what you have to be aware of is that these hinges will then flop around, so try not to catch them or bend them or anything. Um, try and get them back in and well out of the way. Next thing, I'm going to remove the back cover. Well, there are two screws on the bottom and they're going to go in the bottom hinge in my tray. One on the side by the battery compartment or rather the battery terminals for the uh, where the AA holder goes. 
that I don't have. And then another one at the other side by the volume control, which is quite long. And then one on the back. I've labelled all these from my previous one, so I'm going to pop open the battery door on top. Okay, when the screws are out, you get to have fun with clips. <laughs> so I'm just going to dive into a little bag behind me here that's got a few plastic spudger tools and basically a big guitar plectrum. Um, a couple of them, I think. And we'll just see if this one will help us. So a guitar pick actually would probably be ideal for this. So it should come off, uh, battery side first, it should come off this way because you have to be able to get it around the volume control uh, DBB switch and headphone socket here which stick up a bit so you've got to remove it that way. So now that all the screws are out and the battery door is open we should be able to get a plectrum down here. It has to be a soft plastic one so that you don't scratch it. And we should. There's one popping away. Hopefully be able to pop some clips under here. There we go. Makes me very nervous doing that to metal because if you bend it, you had it. And then there's another one, I think under here somewhere. I'm just being very careful. Feeling my way around it. There's definitely one there on the plastic bodied version. It feels like there is something going on there. Ah, uh, there we go. It's given up and we're in. Okay. So little yellow DBB switch will fall straight off. Um, don't lose it, like I lost my first one. <laughs> so, good job I have a spares unit. So, um, the two switches on the back are stuck into the back, so they can't come out. Um, I'll cover this when we go to reassemble, but hot tip. Um, set the switches uh, a specific way, so let's say towards the battery. When you go to reassemble it, these just freely slide around. So put them in the same position and put some painter's tape uh, over the top so that when you reassemble, they land in the right place and they actually grip the switch tops and don't fall at the side of them. Um, I know that because, again, my old EX49, um, it took me two attempts to, uh, to get that right. We'll double check that when we go to uh, reassemble. So I'm going to set the back aside and just have a quick look at what's going on here. So that hinge is already sticking out. I have to be very careful with that. So I can see a bit of belt and it's half gooey, much like my, yeah, I see it's breaking up half like my uh, other one was and there is a small screw with an arrow pointing here which we need to remove and then we can fold over the board because it's attached by two ribbon connectors so that's going in the slot that says PCB so this ribbon connector here uh, comes from the head this one comes from the motor. So now that we've uh, popped that away, we can lift the board free. This is a little different to the EX49. The EX49 has a little clip here that you have to make sure you pop the board from underneath before you lift it up. And also, because we've got a different battery arrangement, we've got wires here. So I'm just going to carefully lift this and just see what we'll have to do. I think they will have to be desoldered so that I can fully lift the board backwards. So 
So I'm going to do solder these from this end. So I'm going to pop my iron on. Get a little bit of flux. So the red one goes to there. The grey one. I move it out of the way. Goes to there. Yep, okay. My shaky hands again. So now, I can carefully flip this board over and just watch this folded ribbon cable here. When you flip the board over, it will kind of flip back underneath the board. So just be wary of what that's doing and be wary of when you put it back what it's doing. So we can immediately see. Um, a date stamp on the flywheel. Um, well, the one didn't have that, and the remains of a belt. So, yeah, this is a little further gone, I would say, than the belt that was on my other one. Yeah, it's breaking up into pieces. I did just about manage to. There we go, drag some of it off the other one um, in one piece, but this is a bit worse. So I want to get as much as I can out of this motor. I want to know that the motor will spin really feels like it will these are basically a miniature induction motor so they use um, they work at a very low voltage because we've only got one cell so you get 1.5 volts from an AA or 1.2 volts from a rechargeable cell and uh, they use a servo to uh, drive, I think it's three coils, so I guess it's a sort of three phase motor and uh, I don't know if they have any kind of feedback winding, I'm not sure, but they basically give it a constant voltage by firing pulses into each of those coils in succession that way it can regulate the um, voltage to the motor and thus the RPM as the battery voltage droops. Um, one dead giveaway of a bad motor if you've recapped the board is that um, as soon as you start to drop the voltage to around, well let's say well, less than 1.5 the motor immediately starts to struggle. That's what my other one was doing and then it started to seize. So that will freely move. It's a bit gunky. So already I've noticed we've got a cracked gear on that reel. And it's very likely when we come to it that the uh, clutch gear under here will also be cracked. Just going to zoom right in here to point out something else I forgot to mention. Um, these two little red clips, they're basically little pressure fit clips. They're also prone to cracking and um, they hold down elements of the auto reverse selector switch a mode switch and the actual direction uh, changer switch um, on one of the ones that I've done uh, one of these had a little crack in it and it came straight off so the switch assembly wouldn't work properly so I had to take one from my spares uh, unit they're unfortunately plagued with um, all these little gears and sort of played with this problem. I believe they're made of Delrin um, and it's unfortunately prone in certain things to split in just like, I don't know if you can see the little split in this gear here, this is back of the reel gear. So if we get this to run that reel will likely just pull straight out because there's not enough pressure holding that little black pin in. The fix on these is actually to super glue them but you have to be very, very careful about how you apply the super glue because if you let it run into the edge of the gear, you'll gum the gear teeth up and then it won't rotate properly. Ask me how I know. Um, and then this one again, same issue, 
but it's right under this gear which is the half moon gear which is involved in the direction changing the auto reverse mechanism when you actually select the auto reverse uh, or when it gets to the end of the tape and detects it this comes into play and flicks over uh, to play the other side so this is obviously right underneath this gear so again you've kind of got to if there is a crack in it is there a crack in it? let's see I don't see one but on the two that I've re repaired uh, two mechanisms I've done although this one wasn't cracked this one came out first and if you want to glue this one you see it's right next to this half moon gear so you've either got to finagle the half moon gear gap around there somehow or um, undo part of this mechanism it is possible uh, but it's really difficult and actually move this aside to try and get to it if we have to do that here again come to that when we come to that but I would bet that I'm going to have to glue that and glue that even though it's not cracked I bet that will come out but let's not jump the shark there let's deal with this rest of this belt mess first and then I want to see I want to apply a, a voltage from the power supply one and a half volts even with the bad capacitors I want to see what this motor does not so much affecting this model but um, I've seen on slightly later models there's also an issue where the rubber that the pinch rollers were made of seems to react with um, the metal that the capstans are made of and if it's left in play or something when it's put in a drawer uh, I've seen the um, pinch roller rubber degrade to a point where it will completely rust the capstans it's really weird um, and again if you find a model like that make sure you see a picture of it with the door open because I don't think they would be salvageable I've seen them in a real mess um, but if you're ever looking for one of these and you find one online to buy get a picture of the battery door open and get a picture of the head block inside if you see a real mess there run a mile luckily this one um, part of the reason I went for this one is because it doesn't really suffer from any of those problems the battery issue minor um, but the bottom of this looks okay and it's there's no corrosion that's spread anywhere else so I think we're going to be looking mechanical and electronic just out of interest let's just take a quick look at the board um, I haven't seen one of these yet with heavily excessive leakage that's corroded the board or anything like that I can see on one of the little capacitors, I think this one here, I don't know if you can see that, um, that solder joint looks kind of dull and that I think is about the worst uh, sign that I'd seen uh, that these were failing. These are from what, 1990, 1991, so it's kind of in that early days of uh, surface mount capacitors the technology was uh, in its infancy um, in the consumer space at least and it didn't stand the test of time ever so well um, there were other consumer electronics that suffered uh, way more extensively as in board damage from these I haven't seen it on one of these yet um, there is a bit of a sticky substance around here but it doesn't it doesn't look corrosive it doesn't smell of anything it might be flux um, I'm not sure but we're going to clean up the board anyway but this is a very thin very delicate board so you do have to be careful about um, the tools and techniques that you use to get these capacitors off thankfully with captain tape and a lot of care on the last board I, I did I didn't find them too difficult to get on um, but actually sourcing uh, suitable replacements and getting them back on is definitely not easy just got a quick bit of a lash up here I have uh, my test leads connected to ground plane and to the positive battery supply uh, doing one and a half volts from the bench power supply and very technical addition here to press this uh, plastic switch in here I highly recommend wooden cocktail sticks 
you don't want to use anything um, conductive like a screwdriver tip or anything in case you um, either slip and touch part of the circuit or just break it off. I find a cocktail stick just wedged into the hole and just angled right will push this power switch that's engaged when you uh, press any of the physical buttons. Now I'm not completely confident about this and this is why let me turn the power on. You hear it making that grinding noise. Now that was the noise that my first one made that turned out to have a, a worn out motor. The one uh, that I sourced a motor from that worked ran fairly smoothly when it was unloaded. Um, it's drawing about 40 milliamps uh, at one and a half volts there. Let me see if I drop the voltage. Now it's at one volt there and it's not at 0.9 volts. Okay, 0.8 it's dropped off. Now it's actually fairly steady at 0.9 volts. Again, 40 milliamps. So when it's loaded with the belt, when it's cleaned, it might be all right. It's also likely got bad capacitors as well, but I think we're gonna to have to see how we go with that motor because we may end up sourcing a replacement, let's see. A few days later, I'm back to the Walkman project and um, I've decided that um, I think the flywheels are gonna to have to come out of this one. Um, more than any other Walkman I've done so far, the deterioration of the belt um, is has gone further um, than any I've done so far. So it has left some residue right inside the grooves on the uh, flywheels. And I think what I'm gonna have to do is get these in the ultrasonic cleaner and also just uh, under the uh, ribbon cable there. There's a little plastic wheel that's um, just kind of a little tension wheel for the belt path. And uh, that's also got a belt deposit stuck on it and can't really get to it with it in place. Um, that one's got a tiny little uh, clip washer over the top of it. Um, this central wheel uh, has got a little clip washer over the front. And uh, when that comes off, uh, there is another little wheel here with another little clip washer and this is the clutch assembly that we're going to have to repair so it's really common on these to have to remove this one and remove this one it's less common to have to remove this and the flywheels by far the flywheels have clip washers on the front so i'm going to have to turn the thing over uh, but we're going to have to do that realistically um, to make sure all the residue is cleaned off before i stand any chance of getting a new belt on it so um, this is not easy uh, but I'm going to have a go at removing all the relevant parts and uh, see what I can do. So I think I'm going to try and tackle this one first which is going to be awkward to get to because um, I need something to hold this back part out of the way somehow. Um, let me have a think about that see what I can do. Actually looking at this I'm, I'm hopeful I could just hold it out of the way and do it. Um, the obvious thing will be to desolder it from the board, but I want to be able to test uh, the motor and everything once we've got this cleaned up and a belt back on it. So at this point, I don't really want to desolder it uh, just yet. But um, another point to make is that I've got a spare of these transports. So uh, if any of these clips go missing or flying across the room <laughs> or anything like that, then uh, it's not the end of the world, but it will be frustrating. Um, this is also very frustrating, but it, it is possible. Um, I can see myself editing a lot of uh, dead space out here. <laughs> Got it. It's the first time I've removed one of those, now I've got to flip it over. I'll try and get these out. Two flywheels. Yes, I had to do that off camera. Um, 
it was incredibly tricky to do until I found a kind of method for doing it, which is um, to actually put my thumbnail kind of behind the flywheel from the back and just pull on it slightly as I pick the uh, the little clip at the front. If you just try and pick the clip off at the front, you just got no chance of getting it off. But I found if you can just kind of pry it slightly loose, the flywheel will drop and then you'll be able to slide it out from the back and then recover the little um, plastic clip from the top. So then both now in my ice cube tray. So I've got what three parts there that uh, I think are going to go in the cleaner. Unfortunately, I'm going to lose that date stamp on the back of this one, which is a shame, but I've got a picture of it for posterity. It's not going to matter when it's all back together anyway. What I've ended up doing with these is running them through the ultrasonic cleaner, as I said, but um, what I actually did was put a small cup of isopropyl alcohol in the water and put them in that, and immediately it floated off a lot of the... Um, the belt residue but it wasn't the only problem uh, if you've seen the last video I did on the Sanyo boombox where I noted that where um, the belt had melted where it was in contact with the uh, aluminium wheel that was in that it had left uh, like an oxide on the aluminium where it had reacted with the metal I noticed the same thing had happened here there were sort of green deposits uh, left behind after the belt residue had been cleaned off and it just shows you that in, in the same way um, if you leave a belt kind of long enough or if it degrades to a certain state it can actually react with uh, metal surfaces so I've noted this now on aluminium and brass so um, the isopropyl alcohol um, in the ultrasonic cleaner um, don't pour it directly in an ultrasonic cleaner but put it in a small container I basically use the top of a spray can um, and put the parts in that um, by doing that it did actually loosen the uh, deposits a kind of green uh, oxide brass oxide on there and then I was able to actually get a, a, the edge of a bit of paper and just keep running the edge of a bit of paper and a cocktail stick actually around it and then just kept putting it back in the bath until they've come up perfect because they were sort of all full up with um, the kind of green deposits they were actually quite lumpy so as you turn the wheel you could see that the uh, the, the rotational surface was going to be uneven so it was no good just getting the black uh, residue out and calling it a day because the wow and flutter would have been terrible so to get this um, back to a smooth usable wheel um, they had to be you know really intensely clean so they're now much better the only one I've had to do this on um, the others I managed to peel the belts off with no residue but these definitely showed signs of a chemical reaction really all right now all that's dealt with um, I've just cleaned a couple of bits of little belt deposit bits I found around I've cleaned um, this little pulley here uh, that'll be coming off anyway but I've just made sure there was no belt deposit on it there was a tiny bit uh, so what I'm going to do is take a tiny bit of this mobile spindle oil tiniest dab on a cocktail stick and I'm just going to put a tiny tiny bit at the bottom of this spindle I'll do it I'm going to pop these back in um, there's a little bra uh, little um, nylon bushing at the uh, or washer rider at the bottom of that so where it um, presses against the brass bushing there it should be fine and yep I feel good so and just a, little, a tiny bit of oil pop it down at the bottom and pop it in I'm going to make sure that and there we go I feel good so uh, I may as well while I'm here get this one back on let's see if I can lift this out of the way so now I think it's time to get this spindle off here um, 
It's not easy, but I'd say it's easier than doing the others because you haven't got a tall um, spindle on the top of it. So you haven't got too much to get it past. Um, so I've done these a couple of times and it's not easy, but it's not impossible. But those flywheels, I haven't put the clips back on the front of them yet. They were definitely not easy to do. This is actually halfway off. <laughs> so, <laughs> there we go. That just launched itself across the room. There it go. So it does happen. So I'm going to take that off. As I say, I have got spare parts. Chance I might even find it. I felt it go to my right. Yeah, it does happen. And then this one. And underneath this is the clutch that we uh, need to look at. So, yeah, that one's come off fine. Why could that not do that? So, move this spare board. And very carefully, remove this clutch because there's actually a spring underneath the clutch right this tiny black gear on the back is the clutch gear and uh, they're renowned for cracking now interestingly this is a black one whereas it was white on the last one I uh, tried and I do actually see a tiny crack has formed in that. So what happens is the black gear there is gripping tightly the other side of this white part here. And underneath this white part there's a, a piece of felt. So this forms a clutch. There's a spring under there that holds the whole thing to a pressure. So this black gear has to grip tightly that little white shaft and if it cracks it loses grip. So much like I've explained in other videos about sort of tape mechanisms, the wrong part turns into a clutch all of itself uh, and then you lose take up tension so in, in short bursts. So you get these little bursts where the tape will be taking up fine and then it will stop and it will start to form loops of tape in the top of the mechanism so what we've got to do is separate this black gear and don't lose the spring and that tiny black gear we're going to replace with an aftermarket one so all the parts I'm going to put in the tray there just to show you there's the uh, the felt underneath and the little plate that presses down on it to form the take up clutch. Here's a replacement clutch gear. This comes from uh, fixyouraudio.com. Uh, these are based in Slovakia. Not a sponsor. Um, this is for the EX49. It's exactly the same mechanism. Uh, it says EX49 because, yeah, quantity two. So I ordered two of these uh, with a view to do a second Walkman. And this is going to be the one I'm going to do. So what we're going to do is get the spring in place and then press this down. That's as on as it gets and that is our new clutch gear fitted. And make sure it lines up with that gear underneath. You can see that moving. That's clutch gear done. And then this little wheel's also got a little gear on the uh, bottom there that aligns with the edge of that one. So, and that one goes back on as well. And then I'm going to have to uh, steal one of the little clips off the uh, the other one. Actually, I think I'll do the, before I do that, I'll put the little uh, clip on the clutch gear back on. And if you get those right you can just press them back on with your finger but it's not it's not easy so that's on fine and we can pop that one back on 
This one I found in the past was a bit more difficult to get back on. I don't think it stands quite as proud as the clutch one. So after I'd done all this cleaning yesterday on the flywheels and this little reel here, um, I cleaned the motor pulley and I obviously can't, uh, well I can remove the motor but obviously I can't um, ultrasonic clean the entire motor. So what I ended up doing was soaking a scrap of paper with acetone and acetone of course evaporates very quickly. Running power through the motor and just getting the very edge of the paper and just running it along uh, the inner groove of the uh, pulley on the motor uh, to get all the gunk out of there and it's come up pretty well I'm quite happy with it so um, the next thing I've got to do is glue these reels and then I'm going to leave them overnight and then tomorrow I'm going to put the um, the plastic clips back on the uh, spindles on the flywheels the capstans from the other side and then I'm going to thread a belt on it apply power to it and uh, see how well it, it runs so what I'm going to do with the super glue if this tube is all right we'll soon find out is put a little dab on a piece of tin foil just out of shot uh, yep it's okay so I put a little dab on there and I'm going to get this uh, butterfly gear a half moon gear sorry I believe it's called try and get that to sit it's going to spring isn't it do you know I might have to put a bit of tape on that tape that into place overnight hold That's fine. I'm going to get a cocktail stick, dab a little bit in the glue, and I'm just going to put a tiny bit in like that. Yeah, you only need a really tiny bit just to sit kind of right in the middle there. The problem with trying to do it straight off the bottle is it'll just go and just go everywhere and you absolutely don't want that you just need a tiny bit to sit in there to work its way down there there we go that's more than enough then I'm going to do the other gear again I'm just going to dab it around the top it's so easy if you overdo it let's say if you pour it straight out of a bottle for it to end up in the uh, teeth of the gear and then you've stuffed it if that happens um, it's better to have too little and to have to redo it than it is to uh, have too much and ruin it because it did happen to me once Try and get a tiny bit into that crack. And leave that for tonight. Uh, come back in the morning, belt it up, and uh, see what it does. All right, the sun's kind of in and out uh, at the moment because the weather's a bit all over the place. So hopefully the lighting stays fairly consistent. But let's get this belt on. The glue's had overnight to dry, so hopefully should be all right now. Uh, as usual, most of my belts, this has come from Deck Tech, uh, not a sponsor, but they've just been a really helpful supplier uh, to me. And although it says WMEX 49 on it, the mechanism is exactly the same. It's just because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I repaired a 49, so at the time uh, I bought two of these. So I will try and show the belt path. I've done this enough times now that I kind of know it by memory but I will try and show you the belt path that it takes because at first it doesn't look like it makes sense um, and it kind of explains why 
the grooves on these flywheel pulleys are so deep um, it does make sense when you actually do it this is the hard bit getting this thing to stay out of the way and that around there that around there that off of there and that around that half of the flywheel and that there that's it that's in I've got to put the clips on the back of the flywheels, I must remember to do that. For the sake of showing that clearly, the, that belt path, I'll put an overlay uh, on this that just shows you the uh, exact path that these take. So I'm just going to give that a spin a couple of times just to get any kinks out. Let's see if I can do this without firing them across the room. Before I actually run this, I'm going to give those pin trollers a clean as well. They're uh, a little bit mucky. Dying fire. One step forward, two steps back. I had to take that back off and take this white gear off, loosen the motor to get this off because I, when I was doing the glue in, I've obviously got glue to run down into that uh, shaft where it shouldn't have done and it's seized up the little peg um, that's now broken off the uh, back of the spindle. Again, it's the forward spindle. I've got a spare again on this scrap deck, but I'm gonna have to risk Getting some acetone down there. I hope this is Dolrin and not ABS. Uh, I'm gonna have to get some acetone down there to see if it will dissolve that glue. I can push this back out, uh, and then I can put a replacement uh, take-up spindle back through. Bugger! I managed to do it. This hole here is where it was, and I had to drip a little bit of acetone through a thin tube. But the other side, well, at both sides really to just try and get it to uh, wick through and then I managed to push on it and it gave way and it went through and it looks like this is fine again I believe this to be Dalrin which is um, acetone safe if this was ABS we'd be in trouble uh, so I have got as I said another um, spare gear and um, take up spindle I fitted a spare um, spindle to uh, the gear that was originally there and when um, I was turning it I could feel it um, kind of meshing somewhere and when I looked closely at the gear I realized that the split in the gear had kind of disturbed the um, geometry of the teeth so it hit a certain point when it was going round that it would snare up a little bit and I couldn't leave it like that because these are so sensitive to any kind of tension that shouldn't be there it's liable to just keep tripping the auto reverse mechanism they're really touchy about it now what I realized is the spares unit that I've got um, had got the same gear in that I previously glued but it went round smoothly it didn't it, although it had, had a crack in it it had not kind of landed at the edge at a point where um, it upset the gear geometry. It was perfectly fine at the edge. So I decided I'd try and get that gear out. I ended up um, again trying to put some acetone on to soften uh, the join uh, where the, the little black stem goes through the white gear. And um, that one also broke off. <laughs> so I've ended up breaking two of these uh, these little spindles, tape spindles 
And what I had to do in the end was take that gear out of the spares unit, put it in a drill vise, get a rubber mallet and a, and a steel punch, and knock it out. <laughs> it was terrifying. This tiny little plastic gear, I had to um, yeah, use some force to get it out. Um, and then I've put that gear on another spare spindle, uh, put the spring back in and everything, and another spare spindle, and done a tiny bit of glue on top. I let that set, and this now goes round fine. So I put the belt back on, and um, connected the power, and I am convinced this motor is going to need replacing. I think it's got the same corrosion as the very first one, the EX49 that I did, that after doing everything to it, the motor was starting to fail. It's drawing a bit too much current and it's it's unstable at 1.2 volts and it doesn't it just doesn't sound right. It sounds like it's got the corrosion problem. I'll show you what that means in a second by um, showing you on the spares unit that I've stripped down, but just to prove a couple of points, it does run mechanically and the board capacitors are knackered because if I put the power on and just trip these two switches on the board, turn the volume up, you can hear all the noise and static blaring, uh, blaring out from the audio amplifier. So the usual thing of, you know, oh, just chuck a belt on, it'll be fine. No, it doesn't solve any of this. It doesn't solve the mechanical issues. It doesn't solve the damaged motor. So. Uh, these motor assemblies, these induction motors, once you break this seal around the edge and um, take this top cover off, there's another little plate that floats on top of the, uh, kind of on, the, on a little ledge on the, um, on the spindle and floats just above the coil board. That's that little uh, plate there. And then there's a coil board, which is a very thin circuit board with this uh, ribbon cable coming off it and this part soldered to the main board, so that's here. And then when you get those out, kind of by force, the uh, magnet of the motor rides on a bearing at the bottom of the motor there. And when they sound terrible, you're liable to think it's the bearing that's gone. It's not the bearing. If you can see, if I cover that up a little bit, the top surface of the magnet is all bubbly. And it's a corrosion that gets underneath the coating on the top of the magnet. You can keep that in focus. And um, causes that surface to be uneven. Now that surface is when it's uneven it is rubbing against the coil board and so there's some friction there so it's not in the bearing it's in this flat surface of the magnet and the tolerances in these are so slight uh, they have to be very 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 close together and they have to kind of float which is why you see you've got this it's a really strong magnet as well it's probably neodymium um, this top piece that binds it together so I'm going to guess exactly the same thing is happening to this one, which is why we've got um, high current draw and grinding noise and friction on the motor. And yeah, if I get in carefully and scrape under that, I can scrape holes in that top layer. And I can see it's corroded underneath. So. I don't know, I don't know if I can refinish that top. This is at least a spare motor I can experiment with to see if I can do anything about that rough surface. And if it works, I might be able to do it to this one. Otherwise, it means getting another machine that's hopefully got a good motor, like I had to do with uh, this one, this 2091. The motor from this and a couple of the mechanical parts ended up in the 49 that I fixed. So that was a donor uh, machine for a, for a donor motor. And I think we're also going to need one for this. And then of course I've got to tackle 
the capacitors on the main board. And if you ever get the inkling to start fixing Walkmans, seek medical advice, perhaps ring Samaritans, stay away from high bridges. So after messing around with these motors and this corrosion issue on the magnet, I've been doing some experiments. Um, I may have mentioned earlier this um, EX49 motor that I originally wrote off from my first Walkman that I repaired. Um, I took this apart completely, took the um, coil board out and everything. Um, got that um, bubbly looking magnet plate out as I showed in the previous clips. Decided to try um, refinishing it really with um, just some wet and dry sandpaper, just using it dry. And uh, I'll, I think I took some photos of that actually, I'll try and just include them here. Just to see if I could get those bubbles out. I was aware that this can't be a permanent fix because if you leave the magnet iron exposed uh, it will be susceptible to corrosion again. Um, I think that coating on top is nickel and um, I don't know what causes it to uh, puncture or whatever happens that corrosion is working its way underneath. I don't know if the, um, the material of the magnet's tainted somehow, I don't know. But um, that nickel is supposed to protect it from corrosion and obviously in certain cases it's not working at all. There's corrosion forming underneath and it's causing it to bubble up. I don't really know what you could do about that uh, as a permanent fix. I don't really know how you could go about removing the entire layer of nickel and then possibly recoating it, replating it or something. I don't know how I could do that at least, um, you know, just at home in my kitchen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an electroplating expert or anything like that, so um, I decided just to try and sort of sand it down, clean it up with alcohol, and then um, clean and uh, lubricate the bearing. Uh, on the stereo to go forum, it's recommended that you use a little bit of oil, fine oil for the actual centre of the bearing, and a tiny bit of grease on the top of the bearing, so I did. And um, I soldered some temporary wires to a spare board and I ended up um, gluing the coil board back in with just some tiny dots of uh, epoxy resin um, araldite basically um, just around the edges as the original one was, uh, was done just leaving enough clearance for the top disc to go back on reassembled it and I've got a power supply hooked up to it and that's running 1.2 volts, it's drawing 40 milliamps, it's a consistent speed, it's not growling at me and I've been running it for a while on and off and with a voltage anywhere between 1 and 1.5 volts and I can actually get this down, that's 1.1 volts, that's 1 volt 0.9 we start to drop the speed but the speed is consistent so I think I've at least sorted out the um, the physical clash that was happening there so anyway waffling on here's what I'm going to try this board of the 190 I'm going to desolder it completely because I'm going to want to work on this board anyway so I'm going to desolder the head wiring and the motor wiring. This one I'm going to bolt onto the chassis of this, uh, thread the belt around it and see if this will run uh, this mechanism better than this one that's already in. If I'm happy with it I'm going to put the top plate back on it and leave that clamped down with a little bit of um, epoxy glue around it to seal that back up. Uh, and basically go from there. It's not completely necessary to remove the head and motor wires when you're working on these boards but I do find it helps. So I've got a little bit of solder 
uh, sorry, a little bit of flux uh, on this just to help melt the solder. And there we go. And the trick is not to pull on it heavy because it's really easy to um, rip the contacts on the back of these. So. Pull this one this way, I think. There we go. So that's the board off. Remove the belt from that. And these two screws on the front here, inside the tape well, they are the motor screws. out. Just spinning that in my fingers I can feel it knocking so it's definitely got corrosion issues that motor. So as an experiment let's just see if we can get this one in. The reason I have this little four-way ribbon cable here instead of the proper flat flex is the flat flex off this original motor, what I was saying earlier about desoldering it, it's been handled that much. One of the um, one of the pins on it, if you will, um, has actually split. It's broken off. So if this motor works, I'm going to have to swap the flat flex uh, from the other motor onto this one. So I did this just to get a flexible connection between these two boards to experiment with. Will it work? Hmm, something's unhappy. No, something's unhappy. It's making no sort of noise. Hmm, what's unhappy about? Hmm, okay. Oh, okay, that's weird. Giving it a leg up. We're drawing 70 milliamps at 1.5 volts if I come down. Yeah, it's still running at 1.2. But it's not got enough torque to jump start itself. Hmm, it's a little shaky. It's happy at 1.5. I say that could be this board. 1.2 volts, it's a bit sketchy. Again, could be the board. But it's current draw is not high. Just got to keep playing with it, I guess. All right, I think it's time to start working on this board. I'm going to remove uh, most of the capacitors with hot air. There's a couple I might go in with um, a wide soldering iron tip. Um, I've judiciously covered it in captain tape because there are things like very tiny passive components, switches and such on this. I'm going to change some of that around as I go. Um, if this is your first board of doing this, I don't recommend doing them all at once. It's better to um, do a few key ones and then try it, see what a difference it makes. Um, I've also got um, obviously a second one of these boards on hand so I know exactly where everything goes because I have a second reference there. I've done one of these before as well so as it's not my first rodeo so to speak I am going to do all of these in one go to save time. Uh, so got my hot air station set to 300 degrees. Let's see how we go on. So I think I'm going to go in this top corner first and this is the one where I'm noticing some corrosion on the solder joints so that's definitely one of the first ones to start leaking uh, but they're all guff, they're all no good so they all have to go, even these little black ones so um, let's get stuck in
Okay, a couple of things. Um, I rushed that a little bit. I should have slowed down a bit there. I have caught a little bit of the volume control dial. It's hard to avoid, but I should have put some foil over that really so that has warped ever so slightly. Mm, I shouldn't have done that. Also, um, there's a tiny diode that's come off from here. I've got it safe in uh, in my uh, ice cube tray there, but just here, just behind this capacitor. This is a bit of a worry. This looks like this is the one that's had the worst leakage. And I'm hoping it's not taken the pad off because that doesn't look good. Um, if you can see the majority of them have got some kind of leakage. Definitely the, the main one here. This one seems to be the worst culprit. They all look they all look dodgy and that smell of the board I'm getting a little bit of that fish smell that you get when uh, these are worked on looking at the bottom of some of these caps look definitely uh, on the way to leaking <laughs> well on the way so I'm just going over these with a foam tip a cleaning swab and some alcohol I don't recommend, uh, if you can avoid it, um, I don't recommend the standard sort of cotton buds because they've got uh, cotton fibres that can snag. It's better to use these foam ones if you can to do the initial cleaning before I start removing the solder. I'm still not sure about that one. The pad around here that looked like a bit of a worry, it's fine. It cleaned up actually really well, but it was a bit alarming when I took that cap off. It really did look like it had taken the pad with it. Um, this is the first one I've done where the uh, capacitor leakage has got to a point where it's actually started to attack the board. Um, I feel like I wish I'd caught this five years earlier but that's the way it goes. So uh, I've done loads of cleaning uh, with alcohol and uh, swabs on this. Um, so I think the next thing is gonna be trying to get that diode back on. And then um, I've looked at starting to prepare the uh, capacitors to uh, put the replacements on. After a bit of a break, I think it's time to uh, get back to this and start recapping. Now, I'm probably going to time lapse most of this, partly because I've got my um, solder fume fan right next to me, and as soon as I turn that on, the camera's just going to pick loads of that up, so it's not going to be ideal. Um, but basically, what I'm going to do, um, I've cut the bottom of this flux tube off because it's right in the dregs of it, but that's actually ideal because I find it's easy to do with a cocktail stick to get just a little bit on the pads to start doing these SMDs so I'm going to use the finest tip on my iron and start doing these and then I will stop and I'll show you what I'm going to do with the little um, black ones that I took off but the standard SMDs are just the usual this one was a really difficult one to find because the height of this is really critical and this particular one only just fits. I can't really find anything um, shorter than that. Uh, obviously the one that Sony used was some sort of specialist one and it only just clears. The height clearance on this is really critical because of how it all sandwiches together. 
um, all the other caps were more or less fine but this big 330 here um, you really have to make sure it's really flat down to the board and yeah it only just goes so let's just uh, try one So for the little sideways ones, what I've got is a regular uh, standard, very small through hole electrolytic. And what I'm going to try and do is get it the right way around. So in this particular one, we want the uh, negative pointing towards my left. And I'm going to make a bend very close to the body of the cap. I'm going to bend that towards me so it's going to bend back on itself as close as I can get that starter to the body as possible. It's a fine balance between kind of starting the bend off in a sensible place and not having too much access but also not pulling on the rubber seal but you have to get for the clearance you have to get pretty close to the body like that where there's a very definite bend in the wire but it's not pulling directly out the back of the uh, rubber seal and then I'm going to try and bend it again back on itself get it as flat as I can which kind of means bending the leads a little bit sideways at the same time and then you've got to try and you may not be able to see that so well but you've got to try and spray the legs a tiny bit so that they don't match up with the pads because more or less right at the bend that you've made you've got to cut it if you're going to do this, try and buy enough of these capacitors to screw this up a couple of times. I definitely did this on the uh, first one. Bend the legs the wrong way or just screw it up. Okay, so I think we'll get away with that. Now what I've got to do is get some sharp cutters and nip the legs. Kind of right in the... on the cab, I don't know where those wires went and then that's going to lay near to the side yet, that's going to lay on the board uh, I'll get a bit of flux on the board and this is a kind of strategic thing, you'll notice I've not done these surface mount caps yet because they've been your way. I made that mistake on the first one did all the surface mount ones first and then went to do these and uh, it was a lot harder so I think there's a strategic order in which to uh, to do them. Don't worry about the pad on top I think originally that's just um, to hold the cap down but it's not electrically connected to anything, it's uh, redundant. We only care about the two pads for the electrical contacts themselves. Definitely. 
she's a snail. That's it. Just in time for the battery to run out. It's done. After the camera battery ran out, I finished it off. That little one that um, I showed on the video went fine. The other three, when I went to do them, um, they tried to fight me to the death. Um, they were little buggers, but um, managed to do it. That one's a really difficult one to do just because the access is so tight. And I managed to get solder all over the uh, plate of the volume control there, but it does still turn, it still works all right. But they're a pain to do in that uh, tight little spot there because it's really hard not to touch the LED or the volume control or it's just really tight to try and get the iron in there. Um, that one's pretty tight as well. Again, you have to do that after you've done the little one there really. Um, but it's done so um, I'm not going to test it immediately. Um, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I've soldered the uh, proper board, the one that we've just rebuilt this temporary wire to the chassis that we've been working on the power supply is at one volt and it can start up from one volt that's pretty impressive let's go to 1.1 yeah a bit quicker 1.2 which is the standard voltage of the uh, gumstick battery yeah pretty happy there 1.5 should be the nominal voltage of an AA battery even quicker there is a little bit of a knocking sound coming from something here that's the um, the trip for the kind of mechanical trip for the auto reverse um, I think I'll need to get a tape going in it really and see if that's going to be uh, an issue with well and flutter or anything like that but um, I obviously need to get a cover on the motor and uh, get that properly finished get the proper uh, motor cable on here which I've got to steal off another motor and then get the head wires and the ribbon cable the proper ribbon cable for the motor soldered to this board and then try some audio tests Last night I glued the lid back on the motor and I've checked that it still runs, so that's now set. I've desoldered the temporary wiring that I had on there and from this other motor I'm going to try and uh, desolder this ribbon cable and then transfer it to this one. Um, do with something probably to hold that down. Let's get a bit of captain tape again it's bridged it's bridging the contacts got it you need a bit less solder than I thought alright some progress has been made uh, I had to do uh, quite a bit of work off camera because there was noise in the house some of it was just really fiddly um, and wasting a lot of the camera time. Uh, so what have I done? Um, the ribbon cable has been soldered to the motor and soldered back to the board. This took a couple of attempts to get it back to the board because if you don't quite get one of these solder joints um, flowing properly underneath the ribbon cable, the power supply will act as if there's a, um, a short on it more or less. Um, so I had to go and reflow these again and then I got the motor to run. Um, it's lucky that the power supply is um, current limited but yeah it immediately start drawing 500 milliamps so that's obviously not right. Um, managed to get the head on, uh, wires on, soldered pretty uh, pretty well. One um, tip if you want to do this is, uh, well my iron isn't on at the moment, um, when you reflow these joints, try holding the uh, ribbon cable down with a cocktail stick so you can press it down and then get each one of these to flow. Add a little bit of flux or a little bit of solder on the land before you do it um, if you uh, struggle to get that to flow. Uh, but I've put tape in it and audio tested it, run the power supply on it. It was a bit of a lash up, but it worked. Um, sounds fine. Um, 
I've got to clean these switches next. I haven't tried using these switches yet um, because of the position it was in. But uh, yeah, I'm going to clean the switches next. I think I'm going to stand it upright, drop a tiny bit of switch cleaner into the switches and leave it for a bit. And when I next come back to it, uh, I'm going to uh, solder these wires back in and start the reassembly. But I don't think we're far off now. Something important I should have mentioned there. These tiny openings for the switches, when you fix the board back down, there's little metal tabs in the mechanism that press these switches. On this one it didn't give me too much grief, but on the 49 that I repaired, the same board and mechanism before, it was tricky to get the little plastic actuators of the switches aligned properly. You have to make sure that the actuator is pushed back and it's behind the little metal tab, not sitting on top of it because if it's on top of it and you try and push down on the board to screw it down you'll bend the little actuator sideways and risk snapping it off so again cocktail sticks really useful for walkman repair wish i'd thought of it sooner um, things like that try and push the switch back into its housing uh, and sometimes you'll see it click down against the actuator on this one they just happen to more or less drop, drop into place but particularly the power switch the play switch which turns on the um, amplifier the direction switch isn't too bad because the um, I think usually the uh, the metal lever is usually a bit further back but uh, probably depends on the direction that you've got selected but those three before you screw the board down completely um, be very careful with those because it could be really easy to break them at uh, the very last stage back on the 190 again and I've managed to get hold of one of these uh, new gum stick batteries and the little USB charger that you get with them I don't know how good these are particularly they're fairly cheap but um, I'd much rather buy one of these that's new than try to seek out like one of the old uh, Sony batteries or whatever which is probably 20 plus years old it kind of seems pointless so I've got one of these uh, I've soldered the battery wires back onto the terminals at the back and I have tested this and um, it does work. Um, also off camera this battery terminal, I don't know if I pointed that out in the earlier bits of the video, there was just the smallest bit of green corrosion on there and elsewhere in the house I've actually been using um, a lime scale remover spray which has been amazing for all um, the plumbing that I've been cleaning with it. I actually tried a little bit of that on it and it really worked well. After um, doing it with that, I think I just cleaned it out with a little bit of water on a, a cotton bud and I, I applied it with a cotton bud and cleaned it with a little bit of water and then um, cleaned it with alcohol on a cotton bud after and really kind of got the alcohol to soak through to get rid of any residue or acids. But it brought it up really well and it does run uh, when I can close the thing properly. Um, one thing about kind of handling these is because the you see the edge of the belts exposed there, the wheels are exposed. They're quite hard to handle and test at the same time when they're not completely enclosed. Um, so you have to kind of st strategically hold it, <laughs> if I can say it, um, and just try to get it to run. And you might also get the audio to buzz and all that sort of thing. But yeah. Um, it's running. Um, the auto reverse is working as well. If I move that side, yeah, that's fine. And I have actually run a tape through it again. It's a bit precarious when it's not all together, but just this. Spare cassette here. Um, it makes that noise I've noticed when uh, I first start it up sometimes, but if I run the reverse button a couple of times, it, it clears immediately. Um, again, that might just be from me messing around with it, I'm not certain. But it is kind of at that point where, yeah, I need to start getting it back together and uh, kind of testing it properly. Before I do that, I actually want to calibrate the speed on it. 
Um, it's worth always checking the speed with these when you've been soldering around the motor wiring because the speed adjustment pot is just there. It's a tiny little pot and it's just underneath uh, the motor wiring. If you get any kind of flux or anything in like that, it will drift. Um, I think I did that on my 49 that I repaired and it was quite a bit out and I did have to um, tweak that a little bit. So let's have a go at that actually. Let's get a speed test tape in it, hook it up to the scope. All right, I'm gonna jump into putting this back together because I actually had a quick check of the speed on the scope before I rolled the camera and the speed's fine. It's fine in both directions, it's okay. So this trick I mentioned earlier uh, about locking the switches to one side, I'm gonna lock them to the right, tape over them uh, with a bit of masking tape so that uh, when you put them on, you set the switches to the same position. When you reassemble it, they don't miss because that's happened to me once and then you have to take it all apart again so use a cocktail stick to set both switches to the right to the right yep there we go and I actually uh, did clean the switch on the DBB as well I'm going to set that to the right as well I did clean that little switch as well. A tip if you are um, cleaning these with switch cleaner is if you're using something like the Oxit with the straw, don't spray it straight in because way too much will come out and it will just douse it. Um, give a couple of good squirts onto a cloth or a scrap of paper or something and then you'll get, it'll kind of dribble down the tube and you'll get a little bit of remnant in the tube that will drip out and get one of those drips and just touch it you don't have to even have to press the uh, the button just touch the pipe to the switch and one of those little drips will just trickle in and then hold it for a bit activate the switch a couple of times and then leave it for 10 or 15 minutes just in an upright position for the stuff to wick through um, I always find it works best with switches if you leave it for a bit I sometimes leave them overnight but put them in a position so that the uh, the stuff will whip down into the contact um, on one of my earlier sound tests this switch was a little bit scratchy so it should be better now volume pot no scratching or anything on that that feels and sounds fine uh, so getting this back back on so I'm going to need my little yellow DBB switch and I've already dropped it um, there is a certain way, that's it. So on the back of these, I don't know if it's so small, I'm not sure if I'll get this on camera. There's the little bit that grabs the switch and then you probably won't see that, but trust me. There's a little bit that grabs the switch and then there's a tiny little peg. The tiny little peg rides in that little slot there. And the bit that grabs the switch, it obviously grabs the switch, so. Um, I wish there was a way to tape this on as well, but there isn't because it goes under the cover. So that's it. You should feel it activating the switch. We'll see how many times that comes flying on or off. You know, it might not be so bad on this model. It was really awkward on the 49. Yeah. That's better, okay. So you have to make sure that the headphone socket is fully pushed through that little hole. Otherwise, yeah, it won't push over the edge. And the DBB switch has popped out. <laughs> I hate that switch so much. I have to undo it. All right, I've done it. I actually found it easier to stick the DBB switch in the middle. I want to say easier, I don't mean by much. But that will be the bit that will drive you to frustration. Uh, it's really tricky, that. Tiny bit of glue or something there, might be flux, that will clean, but that works. Two switches on the back work. Oh, look at that. Oh, 
looking good. So now it's a little bit easier to handle at least. Still got to put that hinge right. Let's just double check. Still right with that. Still running. Cool. We're getting there. Okay, I'm not going to screw the back on first. I'm actually going to screw the door on first before I put the screws in the back. Because I can pop the back, back off if there's any minor troubles without putting all the screws in first. But to get the door and the hinge on it has to be screwed in. So uh, there is a tiny little peg on the bottom left hand side that you need to line up. Uh, with a little hole in the door, like so, and then there's a little screw on the right hand side, so, door side, I believe it's that one, I have to remember now which screws are right, door side is this one I believe, it's got a tiny little collar on it, the door and on so now there are two screws that fasten to the hinge well, on the, the latch mechanism on the top works well it still looks like a workman so that's a start let's see if we can do this hinge so these are two identical screws I've got something slightly wrong there. I think I know what it is. There's a resistance when I go to shut the door. There is a tiny tab on the hinge and I think I've got it the wrong side of this little carriage for the, uh, the cassette. I think it should be uh, behind it and I've got it in front of it, I think that is wrong it makes sense so that when you pull it it would pull the cassette carriage forwards yeah, that is wrong ok, so I'll have to take those out, I did wonder about that take those out, a few bits on these need multiple attempts <laughs> It's bits like this I'm trying to be really delicate with because it would be the prime candidate for something you just screw up at the last hurdle, which is just silly, so. No, I've still got it wrong. <laughs> this is gonna take a few goes. No pressure, these aren't the tiniest screws ever or anything. So we've got three screws in the door, so all that will be left then will be the two on the bottom there uh, for the back case, the one on the back case there, one on the side and there's one on the other side there. I am going to, as I say, I'll tell you what actually, I'm going to put these bottom two in, put the uh, the others, I think I'm going to hang around on until I'm completely happy that I don't have to go back in it for a while at least. <laughs> that is running with a lovely about 1991, so period correct, big hub TDKAR. Doesn't that look cool? Um, all seems to be going. Can't remember what's exactly on this tape, if anything, so I can't give an audio snippet of this one, but I'll find something else that I can. But it does look like it's running. Just 
checking the fast winding. That's <laughs> not so sure on these little 1.2 volt batteries about winding full uh, reel. Uh, I do think they'd be better really the Iowa style with a 2 volt battery. They should have cranked the voltages up about them I think. I think they were running a bit close to the margins with a 1.2 volt. I think I'm happy enough at that for now. I think I'm going to uh, run that quite a bit and just live with it for a bit and uh, see how it is. Um, so you can see all these people that uh, put on eBay, you know, fixable for a fiver, only needs about, of course, you know, easy peasy. Um, absolutely right, it takes no effort or skill at all. Um, you only need a five pound belt, you can find them on eBay. Uh, it's not like you need 15 surface mount delicate capacitors. It's not like you need uh, replacement gears that are handmade from somebody in the middle of Europe. Uh, you know, it's not like you need an entire spare Walkman or anything. It's not like you have to try and source motors from Japan or brand new gunstick rechargeable batteries uh, that aren't even a standard. Uh, you know, you don't need any of that. Obviously, you just need to chuck a five pound belt in it and you can fix it in 10 minutes five minutes if you're rushing uh, easy peasy takes absolutely no skill at all so by all means have a look through the video and uh, you know if you fancy five minutes of a really really simple job um, by all means go and give yourself a shock uh, yeah that was loads of work um, they're absolutely not easy at all absolutely worth it I think um, just really really nice uh, to have them and have them up and running again and when I'm completely happy with this, I'll bop all the screws back in it and continue to use it. So I hope that was of some use or some entertainment, if any, <laughs> to someone. I hope it gives you an impression of what you have to do to them. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>